Amen. Take your Bibles. Are you ready for the Word? The psalmist said, Your Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. This morning as we look to the Word of God, we continue in our series on stewardship. The first week we talked about living right and, and doing what God wants to do, wants us to do. And then I understand last week Pastor Jesse talked about using our gifts and our talents. This morning I want to speak to you about if you want a great harvest, stop eating your seed. <laughs> Haggai, chapter 1, is where we're going to go. And I, I want to give you a little bit of background before we read the text. Haggai is one of the minor prophets, not minor because his message wasn't important, but minor because of the size of the book. His letter isn't very big, and, and what you have here is four messages that he gives to post-exilic uh, Israel as they came back to Jerusalem. The first message is a message of rebuke for neglect at the house of God. The second message is an exhortation to move ahead and not listen to the detractors or the discouragers. And he even tells them, he says, that the glory you remember from days gone by, it's nothing compared to what God is going to do in the future. That's what Haggai is telling them. And the third message is a message of holy obedience and, and being who God has called them to be. Then the fourth message was delivered on the same day, and it was a message to the house of Israel to understand that Zerubbabel was the direct line to the coming Messiah. That God's promise of a Messiah was not forgotten because of exile into Babylon. That Zerubbabel was that direct line, and the Messiah was going to come through him. Our text this morning comes from that first message of the prophet. Now you've got to understand historically what had happened here, that Israel and Jerusalem, the Judean people, had been in captivity for 70 years. The exiles were coming back, and they had come back in, in two different groups. And as they came back, they began to focus on building their house and taking care of their garden and building their vineyard. So they were taking care of their business. As they begin to settle in the land and rebuild, the word comes from the prophet Haggai. He wanted them to shift their focus. Verse 5 says this, Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You've planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Father, this morning we ask for the anointing of your presence to rest down. This is not a message of compulsion to try to get more out of the people. It's simply your heart to us as the people of God. We believe that you are coming back for a church that is alive. A people that's looking for you. That are walking in holiness and in purity. In faith and in power. This morning let your word accomplish what you desire it to do. Speak life here at Grace Community. As we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. When you go back and you look through the text. As I was reading it during my devotion early on. I thought, boy, this sounds like today we're working harder and it seems like we don't have enough. We're doing all that we can and it seems like everything's just getting away from us. It really does sound like today. We have a culture that is captivated by leisure and play and that if you, for any amount of time, watch commercials. Everything is about if you drive this car, you're accepted better in society. If you live in this kind of house, then you have arrived. If you have so much money in your bank account or if you dress this way or wear this cologne or, yeah, I mean, it just goes on and on and on about what you and I should do to be accepted. I submit to you this morning that it's time for us as followers of Jesus to be more concerned about his name. Be more concerned about his glory. Be more concerned about his mission than we are our personal entertainment. We are a culture that is captivated by going to Disneyland. Think about it. 
After every major sporting event, the winning team, somebody shoves a microphone in the star's face and goes, hey, what are you going to do tomorrow? Tomorrow I'm going to Disneyland. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with going to Disneyland. I love that place. I feel like a little kid all over again. And for the longest time until they raised their prices, we had annual passes. <laughs> I just can't afford it. It's not in my list of priorities anymore. If you have a Disney, so don't be mad at me because, well, Pastor preached against Disneyland. No, I did not. It's on tape. But what I am saying is we've got to stop wanting to be entertained at every moment. We are raising a generation of kids that they have everything, and five minutes after having everything, what's the next words out of their mouth? I'm bored. They've got the newest game, the newest clothes, and the newest music, and five minutes later they're bored. It's because we're giving them the wrong things. You and I must once again be consumed by Him, Christ our King, and His holiness. I believe that our life in Christ is to be reflected to this world by how we live right now. How we live in Christ. How we praise. How we worship. And I want you to hear me this morning. Our praise is directly tied to the Word of God. Our praise is directly tied to the Word. And our giving is tied to our praise. Now listen, this is not about getting more money. We're not going to receive another offering. When I say giving, I mean of our time, of our giftings, and of our resources. Let me show you two praise verses in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 28, 4. You can turn there. Proverbs 28.4. It says, Those who forsake the law praise the wicked, but those who keep the law resist them. Understand, church, that when the Word loses its place in our hearts, as people, we will begin to praise those who are wicked. When the Word of God loses priority and precedent in our life, we begin to praise the wickedness of this world. You say, I would never praise the wicked, Pastor. I love God too much. The word praise here is from the Hebrew word halal, where we get our word hallelujah. It means to boast about, to shine forth, to brag about. Now listen, the man who neglects or forsakes the Word will begin to boast about the wicked. His praise and boasting in the Lord will be turned toward the wicked. You say, but Pastor, come on, really the wicked? It'll be turned away from God, and it'll be turned to the American dad. We'll start talking about the shows we watch on television. We'll start talking about the games that we see or the sporting events. It's amazing to me how many believers know every star player on the Lakers, the Clippers, the Dodgers, the Angels, but can't give me five verses in the Bible. Oh, me. Might need my vest for this one. Bulletproof, that is. We are captivated with entertainment. We are captivated with so many things, and when we begin to neglect the Word, we start praising Sammy Sosa. We start praising these, these athletes. And there's nothing wrong with acknowledging and going to a game. I enjoy the Dodger games with my son. Would I go without him? Probably not. But it's something that he and I enjoy doing together. There's nothing wrong with having hobbies. There's nothing wrong with having people that we look up to. But when they begin to take the precedent and the priority, we are too entertained and the Word of God has lost its place in our heart. The Word of God is instrumental in keeping praise and boasting in our mouths. In fact, we know who is being obedient to the Word, not just by reading it, but how? It says they strive against the wicked, which means they wage war and contend with what they say and how they live. In other words, you and I can't just sit back and condone the wickedness of the world. We cannot sit back and say that immorality and ungodliness is okay. Well, you know, whatever's right to them, that's their truth. No! Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. So truth is not how you want it to be. It's not how I desire it to be. Truth is from the Word of God. And what the Word of God calls immoral and ungodly, guess what? Regardless of the laws our Supreme Court holds up, it doesn't make them any less ungodly. 
It just means that the culture has deviated from the truth. Listen, everybody can hit the mark if you shoot first and then draw the target around it later. That's what our culture is doing. As Christians, our attitudes toward the world, it's all determined by our attitude toward the Word of God. If our attitude toward the Word is right, then our attitude toward the world is going to be correct. The other verse about praise is Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. It says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. The word honor here, from the Hebrew word kabod. I didn't say kebab. Don't be thinking about food. I say kabod. It means, it's where we get the whole concept of the glory of God. It literally means the weightiness to give weight to. And what Solomon is saying here is that you give your praise and your worship and relationship with the Lord. You give it weight when you put your money, your time, and your talent behind it. It really is true, the old saying, put your money where your mouth is. So the, to honor the Lord with our wealth, again, isn't just about what's in our bank account. It's about honoring Him with the substance of our entire life. It's a lot about allowing Him to do incredible things in us and through us. Solomon gets more specific, not only to honor Him with our finances, but with the first. A lot of times, our concept of giving God time is if we have time left over after soccer practice and fishing and whatever else we do. I'll pay my tithe if I have any left over. How many of you like leftovers? Now there's a few of us guys that do. But the, see, you notice how very few of us there are. Because we want the abundance. What's left over? It's what was left from the previous. And a lot of times, if we treat God as giving Him our leftovers, He never really gets anything from us. Because there's never enough to go around. And understand, what I'm talking about here is not just money. It's our time, it's our gifts, it's our talents. But what happens when God isn't honored first? He's usually forgotten or not honored at all. This was part of the problem in Haggai's day. If you go back to the text in verse 6, he says, You've planted much but you've harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. When you and I neglect the Word of God, when we don't honor God first, and we say, I'm working a lot, I'm planting a lot, I'm having a small return on my labor, I'm reaping a small harvest, it's literally because we're putting our things in purses or bags with holes in them. And again, I, I need us, I keep saying this, but it needs to stick here. A lot of times people give of money because they want to try to ease their conscience. Understand, I believe Keith Green said it best. In one of his songs, he said, God doesn't want your check, He wants your life. He's not wanting us to write a check to ease our conscience. He's wanting us to come to a place of total surrender and say, God, here I am. Take me and use me and be glorified. You say, but I don't have any gifts or talents. Not true. God created each of us in His likeness and His image. He gave each of us different giftings, whether it's the gift to teach, the gift to serve, the gift of hospitality. He's given so many gifts. And we withhold them. Understand that every time you and I respond to God, we allow Him to do incredible things. But something that we haven't dealt with yet, and I hope to in the next few weeks, is the issue of first fruits. And how it literally means three things. First of all, that word first, it literally means that, to be first. It's a tangible way of saying to God, I surrender. So you get my life. You get my time. You get my talents. You get my abilities. You get my money first. You get me first. And then everyone else gets leftovers. But first fruits was more than just first. It also meant the best. It meant to give God the absolute best. It means to give to Him what 
others would say, you know what, yeah, I'm going to give to God. And we've had this happen in church history, okay? I'll give you for instance. One day I showed up when we were over at the other property. One, one morning I showed up to work real early, and right in front of the church door, someone had unloaded garbage. Oh, it, maybe they didn't think it was garbage, but I did. It was a used mattress and box springs, and it was old clothes that were not even, Goodwill wouldn't even take them. And they dumped it off in front of the church and, and left me a note and said, please send us a tax receipt, and I didn't. Because I put, our dumpster had wheels, and I rolled the dumpster right up to it, and I threw it away. It was garbage. He, the guy called, he didn't go to our church. He says, well, I want a tax receipt for $5,000. I said, not going to happen said, first of all, the law says, I can't give you a tax receipt telling you how much it's worth. And if you want one for $5,000, you need to come look in our dumpster and get somebody to come and appraise what's in our dumpster. That's the law. He thought he was doing the church a big favor. What he was really doing was cleaning out his garage. Let's not be guilty of cleaning out our garage to give it to God. Now, yes, we have rummage sales to raise money, and that's fine. Clean out your garage then. But don't say, I'm giving this to God. I'm making such an incredible sacrifice. No, to, to do this, to understand the principles of first fruit, it's to give God the first and to give God the best. And then first fruit also refers to the tithe. What would happen if every believer tithed on their time? What if we gave God two hours and 40 minutes a day to prayer, to study of the Word, to telling others about Jesus? What would happen if that many hours a day were being given by the local church for the furtherance of the kingdom? You say, well, Pastor, I don't have that kind of time. I wish we could put a little box on all of our televisions. And it tell us exactly how long they've been on for. Or on our computers, on Facebook, and it tell us how long we've been on for. Or on our cell phones, on our Facebook and Twitter app, so we can tell it. Listen, some of you guys Facebook and tweet so much it's ridiculous. I'm going to the bathroom. Who cares? We don't need to know that. Listen, I knew everything that was going on in the church just after I was done in prayer, and I'd be praying. I'd go to Facebook, and I'd look, and I'd say, okay, they're doing this. And I, I get the whole rundown on the whole church. There's nothing wrong with having these things, but we use them as excuses. We don't have opportunity to serve God or to give to God because we're giving it to everything else. First fruits not only represents the first, the best, and the tenth, it also represents that we are grateful that I am grateful to God for what He's done for me. By giving Him my first is saying, God, I love you. By giving Him my best, it says, I'm thankful for what you've given to me. And it says, I understand that when I honor you, you give to me an open heaven when it comes time to prayer. When I come to pray because I am honoring Him, He in turn honors me. How many of us have prayers that need to be answered? Some aren't reaping a harvest because we're eating our seed. The problem that happens is what we call the crisis of materialism. And I believe that's what the people in Haggai's day were dealing with. They were more concerned with their house. They were more concerned with their vineyards than they were the things of God. If you turn over to Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 24, and I, I won't read it to you, but it's the account when Peter... And, and them were, were preaching, and, and they had gone into the city of the Samaritans. And they had brought in the gift. They were laying hands on people, and people were receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there was a guy by the name of Simon in the crowd, and he had been a converted magician. And magician then is not magician now, okay? Magician now is about tricks. Magi magician then was about conjuring spirits. Okay, Simon had been a wicked man, God saved him, and he saw the apostles laying hands on people and them receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he saw this Spirit given. He said in verse 19, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And what he's doing, he's offering to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's saying, how much is it going to cost me? 
We can never act as if, if I give so much, then God will do this. No, no, no. We give out of obedience. We surrender our life out of a love for Him. And you know, there are preachers today that are saying, if you give, you'll get more from God. If you, listen, if you will just support our ministry, absolutely free, I will send you a bottle of water, holy water, for a love gift of $25, but absolutely free, I'm going to send you a bottle of holy water. That's garbage. That's garbage. If you will send us a check for $1,000 with the list of all your prayers, we will pray for you. Can I tell you, you cannot purchase the blessing of God. You cannot purchase the anointing of God. You cannot purchase God's favor. I don't care how many handkerchiefs somebody sweat on. Literally, I've seen them selling sweat on handkerchiefs. That's $1,000 right there. Listen, if you want to be smart with your money, if you want a handkerchief and you want my sweat on it, go to Walmart and buy me handkerchiefs and I'll leave them here. There's no, listen, you cannot buy the presence of God. You cannot buy the anointing of God. Even having a, a, a bottle of oil. When Carlos went to the Holy Land, he brought me back a bottle of anointing oil and it sits on my desk and I pray for people with it. But understand, yeah, that's olive oil from the Holy Land, but it doesn't make it any different than the olive oil that's at uh, Ralph's. It's not the oil that's sacred and holy. It's the prayer of faith and our act of obedience of anointing someone with oil. So the hanky has nothing to do with it. Listen, we've got to, to get away from this culture that says, well, the church only wants money. No, we want surrender. Because that's what God is asking of us. How many people in this community need to meet Jesus Christ and meet Him without the church standing there begging? Listen, we are not called to beg. We are called to prosper according to God's plan and His purpose. Listen, in an attempt to make money off the ministry, it brings a reproach to the body of Christ in the name of God. If we take God at His word, then we believe what it says in the book of Philippians, and my God shall supply all of your need according to His riches and glory. A couple of years ago, I was riding in my role as the chaplain for the Whittier Police Department. We got a call at Bank of America up on Whittier Boulevard. You've seen the, the, the people in the white suits that have the big cross on their sleeve and they've got the big can and they're standing there saying support our ministry, support our ministry. Bank of America filed a complaint against them and so the police came and asked them to move and the guy kept telling me, well, we have letters that says this and letters that say that. And finally, the, the sergeant was getting so frustrated because the guy wasn't listening. He looked at me and said, Pastor, what do you think? of people, Christians, standing out asking money from people coming out of the bank. I said, I think it's wrong. He said, what? I said, I think it's wrong for me or any other believer to stand somewhere and ask people to give us money when the Bible says, my God will supply all of my need according to His riches and glory. And my Bible says that I was young and now am old, and I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed begging bread. Church, we have no business asking the world to give us money for the sake of giving us money to keep the lights on. We are called to be obedient to God. And when the body of Christ is obedient, He will meet and supply our need. Now, that's a whole other thing about selling chocolate and different things to raise money. You want to do that? That's fine. But that's to give money to rescue little girls. That's to give money to, to do other things. But to the take care of this place, it's our responsibility. It's not the world's. Whew! We're going to be here a while. You okay? Understand, there's no begging here. Some time ago, a family that I know was invited by a friend to go to a church to hear a guest evangelist. That morning, the evangelist got up and he said, you may want the grace of God, but I want His favor. And when they said that to me, I thought, I need His grace more than I need His favor. His grace is what saves me. His favor is simply His blessing, and you can die and go to hell with blessing on your life. 
And he went on to tell how he had obtained, quote, a blessing financially from God by using dishonesty and deceit. He went on to give an example how, quote, God, and I use that term very loosely, had blessed him by falsifying a receipt and taking some $400 from a business wrongfully, and he said that God had blessed him. Understand, that is not blessing, that is deception, and the blessing and the favor of God is, will not rest on any behavior like that. The church must not get caught up in that. We want people to know the blessing of God. We want them to hear the message of Jesus Christ. Simon saw Christianity as a way to make money. You know what I call it? It's called greed. And there's a difference between stewardship and greed. Any theology, and I want you to hear me in this. Sitting in my classes there are people from all over the world that we meet together in, in England. So we have people from Abu Dhabi, which is in, in the Middle East. We have people from, from Africa. I'm going to say this. Anything that is preached in America that will not work in Abu Dhabi, that will not work in Ethiopia, or Somalia, is not the gospel. It's greed. Because the gospel is transcendent. It works everywhere. The gospel changes lives everywhere. If the practice of using money for power was known as simony, in 1 Timothy 6, Paul says that godliness with contentment is great gain. Here's the problem. The problem with today's prosperity doctrine is it fosters a discontentment for where you are. In other words, enough is never enough. The characteristic of materialism is greed. What is greed? It's when the visible takes priority over the invisible. It expects, to get, it expects the visible to give us things that only God can give. And listen, God will never give us anything to take His place. God will never give to us material blessing if that blessing will take His place in our life. You and I need to understand that greed doesn't start with what you have. Greed starts with what you think about what you have. It's when stuff begins to come before God. That's where our culture is. Stuff is taking the priority. Now you know that Sherry and I served on staff in the inner city of Detroit. And working in the inner city, we, we lived in the ghetto. Okay? My secretary used to say to the people there, she says, look, we may be in the ghetto, but the ghetto doesn't have to be in us. And there was a saying that especially the young people in our church would walk around and go, you be ghetto. They, they just say it, you be ghetto. And my pastor wrote this illustration, and I said, I, I've got to use this. But you know, I got to thinking about it this morning as I go over, and you could say, if you do this, you're a redneck. If you do this, you're in the ghetto. If you do this, you're Italian. If you do this, you're Hispanic. Because every one of us do these things in our culture. But for the sake of it coming out of the ghetto, it says if you have a big TV that doesn't work, under the one that does, you be ghetto. If you carry your food stamps in a money clip, you be ghetto. If you use a clothes hanger for a TV antenna, you be ghetto or redneck or Hispanic, it doesn't matter. If you have to change channels with a pair of pliers, you're definitely a redneck. No, you be ghetto. If you iron dirty clothes, you be ghetto. Now, this was back in the day when we had car phones. It says, if you have a car phone and no car, you be ghetto. Now, this one gets all of us. If you put water in the ketchup bottle to get more ketchup, you be ghetto. Now, to some of us, this is just life. It's how we roll at our houses, isn't it? And it's funny. But now let's talk about being greedy. If you often say, if I only had, you'd be greedy. If your blood pressure goes up and down with Wall Street, you'd be greedy. If you have to adjust your ethics to get money, you're greedy. If you're envious of the rich, 
You're greedy. You know, in my car, my wife calls me. No, she texted me. I was getting ready to get on the plane in London. And she said, the service engine light just came on. What does that mean? I said, well, it needs to be serviced. You can go by the oil place where we get our oil changed, and they'll check the oil to make sure that's okay. But the light comes on. We call those indicator lights or idiot lights. Those lights come on not because there's a problem with the light, but because there's a greater problem. There's something going on in the car. It says, if your oil light comes on, it says you need oil. But what a lot of people do is they go buy a roll of electrical tape, which is black, and they cover the light because they don't want to see the light. Well, guess what? You can cover the light. There's still a problem with the car. There are indicator lights that go on in our life and we keep trying to cover them up and God is saying, don't cover the light. Respond to the light. I want to move on quickly. Jesus is sitting down in, in the temple in Mark's Gospel, chapter 12. He sits down opposite of the place where the offerings are being collected and people are coming by putting money in the offering and he notices the widow. And she puts in the two mites, which is the equivalent of one penny. And the Lord said, do you see her? She's given more than all of the others. He said, because they gave out of their wealth, and she's given out of her poverty. She put in everything she had to live on. Why was Jesus watching the offering? It wasn't that he was looking to see how, they, or how much they gave. He was looking to see how they gave. And contrasted to the rich was this poor widow who gave one penny. It literally was the smallest currency in Palestine. And Jesus had to be sitting real close to see that much money go in the offering. The rich gave out of what they had left over. After the house payment, after the car payment, after the credit card. This lady gives out of her need. Understand. She could have given every reason imaginable not to give. This is all I have. I have nothing to get food with. But you go back and you read. She gave out of her need. And at that time, crooks were running the church. At that time, crooks were, were selling and, and reselling sacrifices. Jesus went in and turned the, the tables over in the temple because of their behavior. And yet this woman continued. She could have given a bunch of reasons as why not to give. But understand something. She gave out of her need. And again, I'm not talking about money for us. I'm talking about our time, our talents, and our tithe. You may come up with 101 reasons not to give to God your time, your talents, or your abilities, or your money. But understand... You and I will never have a great harvest if we keep eating our seed. If we keep eating what God has given to us to sow back into the world, to sow back into ministry, you got to know that harvest depends on sowing. Our harvest depends on whether we sow. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6-11, it says, whoever sows. If there's no sowing of seeds, there's no reaping of a harvest. Proverbs 20, verse 4 says, A slugger doesn't plow in season. And at harvest time, he looks but finds nothing. So many people are say, Well, I pray. I talk to God. But they're not sowing. They're not sowing anything in the giving of themselves to others, in the giving of their worship to God, the giving of their time, their talents, or, or their tithe. With the expectation... Oh, I'm not plowing a field. I'll just reap off of somebody else's harvest. No. Whoever sows reaps a harvest. Understand that what we as parents do in moderation, our children are going to do in excess. Sowing and reaping. Who you are. You, you want your children to be something? You want them to be godly? Then you better be godly. Because what you are right now, that's who they're going to be times two. What we do in moderation, they will do in excess. In John 12, 24, he said, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Suppose a farmer says, 
I'm not going to sow anything this year. I've got 100 acres. But I sowed enough last year. I'm not going to sow anything this year. And then at harvest time, he walks out with his tractor. And he expects a great harvest and there's nothing. That's what happens. People say, I don't know why God isn't blessing me. I don't know why God isn't meeting this need or meeting that need. Here's the question that you and I need to ask. Are you sowing in the right fields? So many times we're scattering our seed where it doesn't need to go. I'll give you for instance, and I'm going to wrap it up here. When we first moved to Whittier, Wes wanted to play Little League. And where we lived was Murphy Ranch. And we were renting the downstairs of Sister Helen's home, and so we had to sign up at Murphy Ranch Little League. And, and again, I love being with my son, so there was need, help needed there on the team, so I said I'll be an assistant coach. And so we're practicing, and we're practicing, and we're practicing Monday, Tuesday. And they said, we're going to be here Wednesday. I said, well, we're not. Well, we need you here. I said, we'll be at church, thank you. Thursday, Friday, we go practice. Our game is Sunday at noon. I need you here at 10 o'clock. I said, we'll see you when church gets out. He goes, well, you're the assistant coach, and Wes can't start. I said, the priorities of our life is not Murphy Ranch Little League. The priorities of our life is the worship of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Listen, you sow running all over the country and let people tell you when you can worship God and when you can't. What we're teaching our children today is God is important until soccer season. God is important until football season. God is important until baseball season. God is important until water polo season. No. What are you sowing in? What fields are you sowing? What kind of harvest are you going to reap? Our harvest depends on what we sow. Galatians 6.6 6 says, Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. The same is true in your life and mine. The Bible says in Luke, Give and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, and will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. We get the same thing back that we plant. You cannot plant corn and expect watermelon. It's a nice thought, but hey, I grew up on a farm, and when I planted corn, I got corn. When I planted onions, I got onions. When I planted tomatoes, I got tomatoes. Listen, our harvest not only depends on whether we sow or not, what we sow, it also depends on how much we sow. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And no, I'm not having sign-up sheets to try to get you to do more in the church. Here's what I know about church. Statistics have been in the past that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. It's even worse now. The current statistics say that 5% of a congregation do 95% of the work. Wow. And the attitude is, let's just hire some people. How about we just be obedient to God? How about we get excited about coming to prayer meeting? How about we get excited about showing up to minister? What we sow is what we're going to reap. The tithe of my time, of my gifts and my talent is a statement of my obedience. The giving of my offering is an expression of my love. Our harvest also depends on where we sow. If I were to... I've got a rug in my office. Say I were to get some seed and I go throw it under the rug. Is anything going to grow? No. Because we've got to sow in good soil. What are we giving our time to? What are we giving our talents to? What are we giving our money to? Are we giving our stuff and our lives to things that don't matter? Or are we giving them to God? Our harvest also depends on when we sow. It's like the, the people in Haggai's day. He was saying, look, you're focusing all of these things that aren't important. Put your attention back on the king of kings. Put your attention back on me. Understand, our harvest also depends on why we sow. And I know the prosperity gospel of today says, you give to get. No, we don't. We give to obey, and we give as an expression of our love. You know what, church? 
I know people say, well, you go to church because you get paid to. You know what? For the first many years of our ministry, I managed restaurants. I threw newspapers. And I ministered for free. And there were times in the last seven years that when there wasn't money, I refused a paycheck. It's not about doing this because I'm hired to do it. I do this because I believe in the mission. I do this because I believe in the message of hope. There were times in that first five years in Whittier where I didn't know if they were going to come and take my car because I didn't have the money to pay my bills because the church couldn't pay me. You say, Pastor... Yeah, there were times when I had to pray and say, God, how do we get food in the house? Because we didn't have the money. But every week we walked into that place with a confidence and a faith that God would show up. That God in His supernatural power would provide. That God in His supernatural power was going to save the lost and heal the sick. And I still believe that. We are not here to get. We are here to surrender and to give. Our giving should always be in response to a need. And can I tell you, I'm one payment away from my final car being paid for. Oh yeah, God has a way of showing up. Our other car is paid for and Wes is driving it and I have one payment left on my truck. And you know what? We're not running out and buying new ones. These are just fine, thank you. You and I need to make sure we're giving to what needs to be given to. Giving should always be in response to God's command. Giving should be sacrificial. When Zacchaeus was confronted by Jesus, he got saved and he gave. He said, I'll give up to, I'll restore everything that I took and give up to half my wealth. Giving should be secret and humble. I didn't say all of that previously to get an attaboy from you. My deacons didn't know where we were because I refused to tell them. Because it wasn't their place to meet my need. I still stand confident that my God will supply all of my needs. You and I if you think that you can manage your wealth, your time, and your talents better than God can, you need psychological help. God handles it. There are all sorts of demands being made for our time, our gifts, and our money. We can't let the squeaky wheel get the grease because the enemy will always make sure that there's a squeaky wheel. We must let the Holy Spirit lead us into our time management into our serving and our giving. And understand, as we allow the Holy Spirit to do what He desires to do in these areas, He will never contradict the Word of God. The question we have to ask ourselves this morning is, am I prepared to reap a good harvest? Or have I been eating my seed? 26 years ago, sitting in Bible college in, in chapel, I'll never forget Dr. Del Tar, who was a missionary to Africa and later became the president of Assemblies of God Theological Seminary, was speaking to us. I can't remember the full detail of his message, but I will never forget this illustration. He's speaking of an African farmer. And if you look at a, a map that shows the, the climate of an area, much of that area where he served is mostly desert. He told the story of a farmer who had reaped his harvest and, and put aside his grain for his family to be able to eat, but he took some of the seed from his harvest and he hid it away because that was for next year's planting. And he told the story of how the, it got really bad and the family was out, nearly out of food and the little boy was hungry. And was saying, Dad, I want to eat. We need to eat. Dad, please. And one day the little boy went rummaging around through Dad's tools and he found a sack of seed. 
And he came running in and he said, Daddy, Daddy, we can eat. Now look what I found. And the dad knew that, yes, they could eat that right then and there. But then they would have nothing for the planting, the sowing, for a harvest. Or he could suffer through and trust God and take the seed and sow it at the right time. So much of the time, you and I are faced with pressing needs, whether it's the car breaking down or time, demands made up on our schedule. But you and I, if we are going to expect a harvest, we've got to stop eating the seed. And we've got to sow. And if we sow sparingly with our time, we get back sparingly. If we sow generously with our love and our gifts, we get back generously. If we sow with the giving of the Lord's tithe and our offering, He meets and supplies every need. We can trust Him. It's that time where you and I come to that place of giving and putting our money, where, and I don't mean money literally. I mean putting our whole life at that place. We put our money where our mouth is. It's one thing to say, I love Jesus. It's another thing to say, I love Jesus, when he tells us to write the check. Hello? I'm going to ask the worship team to come back. The Lord continues to give vision and direction. I believe that a city is for our taking with a great harvest. But are we going to sit back and say, but I have needs I found that when I give out of my greatest need is when God meets me when I give out of my greatest need of whether it be time or my giving of my talents and yes even my money in a time of great need when I give there is when I begin to reap a great harvest this morning, as Grace Community, we are here not to be entertained. We're not here to be guilt-tripped into anything. We're here to say, God, use us. Those 19 that signed up for the Bible school, the, the Ignite School of Ministry, that's what you're saying. God, use me. And you know what? You're not putting limitations on it. You're saying, God, use me. Why can't our whole church be the Bible school? Why cannot we remove all the limitations that we put on God and say, God, use us? Whether we are the youngest in the nursery to the oldest with one foot toward heaven, can't we say, God, use us? This morning, we want to avoid the cliffs that the world puts before us. Do you want to reap a great harvest? I do. I want to see these altars filled with the unconverted coming to Christ. I want to see these altars filled with the sick being made whole. I want to see this place filled with people being baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. I believe God wants to do incredible things. Father, thank you. Thank you. for your faithfulness and your grace. Father, help us to not leave here thinking that this is about money because it has nothing to do with the dollar. It has everything to do with my heart, our hearts, before you. Help us to not be Christian in word only where we profess with our lips, but our heart is far from you. This morning, I pray that Grace Community Assembly of God would be a, an example of godliness, of holiness, of surrender. That from the youngest to the oldest, we will begin to see a great harvest in and through our lives. God, I pray that we will take our hands off of the steering wheel. that we'll scrape that bumper sticker off that says you're our co-pilot. 
That means, God, that we'll let you drive if something bad happens. We don't want you to be the co-pilot. We want you to pilot our lives. We want you to lead, guide, and direct us in our faith. in the giving of our talents, of our time, and of our tithe. We know that you will supply all of our need. This morning, as we give opportunity for response, I pray, Father, that you would do the impossible right now. Do the impossible right now. No one looking around, every head bowed, every eye closed. I know a couple have had to get up and leave. But I encourage you to stay till the end of the movie. Let's see what God will do. This morning, maybe you would say, Pastor, life is really hard for me and my family right now. And honestly, if God doesn't show up, I don't know how we're going to make it physically, or maybe it's financially or spiritually. This morning, you say, I need a miracle. If that's you or your family right where you are, would you just stand to your feet? If you say, I need a miracle, we need a miracle, just stand on your feet. People are standing all over you. Go ahead, don't, don't worry about what's going on around you. You say, that's me. Yeah, there's people standing up all over. I need a miracle this morning. I need God to intervene. Maybe this morning you say, Pastor, I've been trying to drive my own life. And today, I need Jesus to take control. If that's you, whether it's in the area of health, finances, family issues, regardless of what it is, if that's you, would you just stand with these right where you are? Yeah, people are still standing. Yeah. You see, we're that kind of church where real people live in real life. We're not trying to hide our issues. We just want God to do what He wants to do. Maybe this morning you'd say, Pastor, I'm away from God. I'm away from God or I've never given Him my life and today I need Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If that's you, would you just stand up with these that are already standing? We're going to pray with you. You say, I need to rededicate my life to God or I need to surrender my life to God. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask our pastors and deacons, if they will just come and line across. And those who are in school already, Brother Victor, you're in school of ministry. And others who are in school of ministry that you've already been taking classes, I want you to come and line up here across the front. And those of you who are standing, you say, I need a miracle today. I want you to make your way down to the altar with one of these. We're going to be standing here. My wife and I are going to be standing here with others and we're going to pray with you. Deacons, come on. We believe in miracles. If you're standing, you come and let us pray with you. And if you're going to stay in your seat, please, if you need to be dismissed, I understand. Move out into the foyer and, and, and out there. But if you want to stay in here, then pray with us. Pray with us right now. Hallelujah. Church, in praying with people, one of the things that I'm hearing a lot of is this word fear, 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 fear. I want to tell you this. The Bible says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love. And I want you to hear this, a sound mind, a sound mind. And I want you, if whoever you're sitting next to, just take the hand of the person next to you. Because that's where the enemy is fighting the family in, in our hearts, in our thoughts. I believe that God is giving victory. Father, right now we take authority according to Your Word in the name of Jesus. We come against this spirit of the fear. We come against anxiety. And we rest in You, Jesus. We rest in You. Let Your Holy Spirit bring healing. Let Your Holy Spirit bring renewing of our hearts, our minds, and our bodies. 
do what you desire in Jesus name in Jesus name amen amen now listen the enemy will try to get you to live in fear overcoming fear is a choice you know when the, there are times the enemy hits me with that doubt with fear but when it comes, I know who it's from. And so instead of yielding to it, I go to this. I go to this, and I begin to pray this. I do. I pray this, because the enemy's not going to listen to say, I don't want to hear you. But when I say, the Bible says, the Word of God says, who is the living Word? Jesus. And I stand in the authority of His name, His blood, and His Word. So right then and there, he subdues any fear. Right then and there, he subdues any anxiety. The Holy Spirit begins to move in our behalf. Listen, I know a lot of people had to get up and leave, but you stayed. Let's believe God to do the impossible. Let's believe God to do the miraculous. Let's go out of this place in victory and confidence. Amen? I love you. I thank God for you. Let's believe God to do incredible things this week. Amen. School of Ministry, see you Tuesday night.